we call chromatography. Okay, so whenever we we talk about chromatography, okay, well, one of the things that comes to our mind is separation. Okay, so when when we're talking about uh, chromatography, this is just a technique of separation. So we use chromatography when? So the most common analytical problem is what? The common analytical problem that we have is we need to identify and quantify more than one component in a mixture, right? Whenever we have this, uh, what we call problem, so one technique that comes here is the so-called chromatography, okay? Because most likely if we have uh, samples that contain more than one component, the first thing that we need to do is to separate them. And then once we separate them, we what? We quantify, uh, we identify them, and then, okay, as one of you has a uh, type, okay, we're going to determine the amount or quantify them. So ideally, uh, we need a completely selective method to analyze each component individually in the mixture. So unlike the other analytical methods or technique that we're going to discuss. Chromatography is one that you typically use, okay? If you have a mixture. So it's a completely uh, selective method to analyze each component individually in the mixture. And in the absence of such method, you separate the uh, analytes prior to analysis to avoid selectivity issues. So. Unlike the other methods that we're going to talk, this is the only time that you do separation, okay? And before we go with chromatography, what are the other separation methods that you know? One that we have discussed last time, that's extraction. In extraction, what's the properties that you take into consideration? How do you separate the uh, component in terms of extraction? Anyone? Someone wants to say something? Okay. So we're taking advantage on the solubility. So if you have a mixture that is one uh, that is water soluble and the other is uh, water insoluble, so by just using a solvent, you can separate one from the other, okay? Another method that we can use, separation methods, anyone? Ano pa alam nyo? Okay, distillation. So distillation, what property are you taking advantage to separate two components by distillation? Okay? So you take advantage of its boiling point, okay? So difference in boiling points leads to uh, them being separated by distillation, okay? And another or in the last one that is the main topic that we have is we could say chromatography. Now chromatography, this is a separation technique based on the different interaction of compounds between two phases. So you have this so-called mobile phase and a stationary phase. And 
you have this so-called compounds traveling through a supporting medium. Okay? So whenever you have this chromatography, what really happened is you separate the components through the interactions of the components between the mobile phase and the stationary phase. Okay? So mobile phase can be discussed as the solvent that flows through the supporting medium. Now, we could say there, uh, there's uh, two types of the mobile phase. It can be the liquid phase, giving you the HPLC or the LC, and the gas phase, giving you the GC, okay? So usually the mobile phase is the one that will carry your sample and it will pass us through a supporting medium, okay? Now in the supporting medium, you will have there your so-called stationary phase. So this is just a layer or coating on the supporting medium that interacts with the analyte. So how are the properties of the components that you separated interact with the mobile phase and the stationary phase is the way you separate okay, the different components in a given sample. Now, your supporting medium there, it's just a solid surface in which the stationary phase is bound or coated. So everyone is, we could say, in a solid surface. Okay. So the history of the mobile phase can be what? Or the chromatography can be credited okay, to Michael Kisiewicz when he separated plant pigments, passing it through calcium carbonate or chalk. So the way that the separation take, uh, what we call takes place is due to the interaction okay, of the components with the mobile phase and the stationary phase. So for instance, at initial time, this is your mixture your sample, and then you pass it through. So the mobile phase carry them through the stationary phase. After a certain time, you will see it starts to separate, okay? And separation takes place as more time uh, is spent between the interaction between the mobile phase and the stationary phase until such time that one of them eluted already, Okay, and then the second component, component also eluted. So the analyte interacting more strongly with the stationary phase will take longer to pass through the system than those with weaker interaction. So these chemical interactions are usually chemical in nature, but in some cases, physical interactions can also be used. So try to uh, imagine this in nature. So when you have a pack of insects that's made up of wasps and bees. And then there's some flowers that they pass through. Which one will stay longer in the flowers? The wasps or the bees? Or we could say the fly. So usually the bees will stay longer while the wasp will just pass through. Because the bees will gather nectar uh, from the flower. So as you could see that there is a separation now between the insect, one staying longer compared to the other one. So the same thing that is happened in chromatography. Okay. Now, if you're going to look at that, I'm just going to do the introduction of the chromatography to, 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 to today. Okay. And then I will leave it up to you to watch the recording that we have there. So the type of the primary division of chromatographic technique is based on the type of the mobile phase using this system. So we have the one that is GC and the LC. So as I told you earlier, it's the mobile phase that separates the two. Okay. So gas chromatography, gas is the mobile phase. Uh, in LC or HPLC, liquid is the mobile phase. Okay, but if you're going to look at this, 
the sample that you use in GC, usually it is in the liquid phase. So what happened when you inject it, it volatilizes or evaporate and become into a gas phase. So the carrier gas that you have there is usually uh, a gas, the carrier. Well, in the liquid phase, all you need to do is what? You dissolve it in the solvent and then you inject it and uh, solvent with high pressure being pushed to it is the one that will carry it. Okay? So that's the main difference between the two. And both of them has their own advantage and disadvantage. They have their own disadvantages and advantages. So in some samples, HPLC is the one be, uh, preferably used. In other samples, GC is the one that's preferably used. Okay. So there's always a bias between the two. Okay. So the, 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 the difference, the, the, the main thing that the uh, requirements that you have, if you can dissolve something in a liquid or a solvent, most likely you can use LC only. If you have something that is uh, able to evaporate or volatile, GC is the one that is preferable. But in some instances, there are some compounds that can be analyzed using both GC and LC. Okay, so you can further divide them based on the type of the stationary phase used in the system. So you can have the so-called GSC and GLC. So in the GSC, you have a stationary phase that is a solid and derivatized support. Now the GLC and the other, you have a liquid coated support that you have there. Now in the bonded phase, gas chromatography, you have a chemically derived support. So whenever you have, let's say a GC, this is what you have. So you have here a carrier gas, the flow controller, the injection port, the column, which is what? That's the heart of chromatography. That's the heart of separation because that's where separation takes place. And then the detector that will be able to identify okay, the, the compounds that you separate and then record them. One that can convert what is observed in the detector to one that you can observe okay, when the separation process takes place. So typically that's the uh, flow chart. So the only one that you can replace if you have an LC is this one. Okay. You might have here pumps, and then on this one you have the solvent, because the solvent is the one that will carry. Uh, the pump is the one that will carry the solvent. Okay. Now in the liquid chromatography, they have also several types, and I think it was mentioned there in the recording. Okay, and they are also based on the types of the stationary phase. So we have this so-called adsorption, okay? And when you have an absorption, it only means that you have a solid and derivatized support. Now, partition chromatography, on the other hand, you have a liquid coated or derivatized support, okay? Now, if you have the ion exchange chromatography, so you have support containing the fixed charges. Ion exchange, so that means you can have a, a cut ion or an anion in the <clears throat> stationary phase. Now, if you have a size exclusion chromatography, so you have a photosupport. support, okay? And if you have an affinity chromatography, you have a support with an immobilized ligand. So the way that you uh, look at this one, so those stationary phase that you have, that's the one that you can find in the column. And when you put your sample, you injected your sample, so your <clears throat> components in the sample would interact with the mobile phase, which is the solvent, and the stationary phase that you have there. And that's where the separation okay, would happen, okay? 
questions so far? So what, what we're talking about today is just uh, like a general uh, lecture of a chromatography. Okay. Now you can also uh, classify the chromatographic technique based on the type of the support uh, material used in the system. So we have the so-called pack bed column chromatography. So when it is a pack bed uh, column chromatography, you, you will see here, okay, some of the material that are what we call pack. Yes, it's still what we call chromatography, the molecular size, okay? So what happened there, the sieve that you have there is the one that you have all support. So in the size uh, exclusion, so it can be what? Gel exclusion uh, chromatography or gel filtration chromatography. It's still, we could say the same. Pareho pa rin sila, okay? So whenever we have this, what we call pack column, <coughs> so whenever we have this uh, what we call pack column okay if you're going to look at the inner size okay of your what we call column, you will see that there are some materials in it. Okay, so they, they, they prepare it in such a way that when you pass through it, usually what do you need? If it's a liquid chromatography, if you have a pack column. In gas, it's easier, okay? Because your carrier is what we call a gas. But in a liquid, okay, you, you need something to push it. So usually you have what we call a pressure. Okay, there's pump that uh, push the liquid into the pump column. Okay, now in other, the, the, the open type uh, column, so this is the one that you use either in capillary or the planar column. Okay, so you can have the, the uh, porous layer open tube, okay, that gives you the open tubular or the capillary one. So you can also have this, uh, what we call wall coated open tube. Now the other one, the open bed planar chromatography. So that's the one that you use in paper chrome. Or, anong tawag dito? Anyone? Yung tinatawag natin tender loving care. Thin layer chromatography. Okay? So whenever we have like that planar, uh, what we call uh, thing, so that's an open bed chromatography. So the one that we have in LC and the GC are just this type the pack bed or this what we call the capillary chromatography okay now what do you call this this is the chromatogram okay so a chromatogram is a graph of uh, detector response as a function of elution time so if you have what we call a chromatogram, there are a lot of factors that affect it, okay? But in a typical uh, chromatogram, usually two factors affect the uh, column performance or the separation. So these two factors are what? As your solute elutes down the column, the bond separation occurs due to successive equilibrium between the phases. So difference in uh, migration rates. So that's a good way to maximize 
the separation. Pwede na solute, elute, as the solutes elute down, the column, each solute band inevitably broaden. And the thing is, you need to what we call minimize it. Okay? So typically, you have the chromatogram you have here, the concentration versus elution time. So the concentration is based on the signal that you have. So if you're going to have a chromatogram, typically this is what you have. So this one, the time where uh, it elute, that's your retention time, okay? Now this one, so this is the so-called void time. So usually the void time, that's the solvent. So whenever you inject, as I have told you, you cannot inject it in the gas form. Usually you have a solvent, okay? And when you inject, the solvent is the first one that goes out, okay? So the solvent is just what? Used to introduce your sample. But once usually your, your, your sample injector port is high temperature, so what happened upon injection, okay? Uh, the solvent will separate from the sample. So usually solvent is the first one that will you, okay? And then you can have here the baseline width of the peak in times uh, unit and the half width, the half height width of the peak in times unit, okay? So to, today, mga formula lang yung ano natin. We just talk about these different formulas that we have. And if we're going to take note, okay, the separation of the solute in chromatography, chromatography depends on two factors, as I've told you earlier. A difference in the retention of solute, this is the difference in the time or volume of elution, and a sufficiently narrow width of the solute peak on how good that is good efficiency for the separation of the system. Okay, so first is the difference of time, the retention time or the retention volume, and the second is how good the separation between the two. Okay. So you can have a similar plot made in terms of elution volume instead of elution time. Okay? Because the way that you look at it is how much uh, volume was used before you see the separation. So remember, the one that carries this, uh, what we call sample, is either the gas or if you have a liquid chromatography, it's the solvent. So how much volume of the solvent before you eluted one sample or one component from the other component, okay? So if volumes are the one that we use, the volume of the mobile phase that it takes to elute the peak of the column is referred to the retention volume. And the amount of the mobile phase it takes to elute a non retained component is what we call the void volume. So it's just the same, okay, as the retention time and the void time. Pareho lang yun. Okay? But usually the one that they uh, typically use is the so-called retention time. Okay? So, we go to this so-called solute retention. So, a solute retention time or retention volume chromatography is directly related to the strength of the solute's interaction with the mobile phase and the stationary phase. So before we go on this thing here, let's try to see what's really happened during the separation process. So try to imagine what we did last time, the liquid-liquid extraction. What happened in the liquid-liquid extraction? Diba meron kayong uh, two components, right? So you have a sample. So the sample can be what? Go to one of the solvent or the other solvent. So there would be what? Some sort of a K, which is S2 
over S1. Okay, so the solute that we have there, it can partition between one solvent and another solvent. So usually, we have this what we call K. Anong tawag natin dyan sa K? K is your? Partition coefficient, distribution constant, equilibrium constant, whatever. So ganun din nangyayari sa tinatawag natin chromatography. Now the partition that we have here is between what? It's between the stationary phase and the mobile phase. Okay? So the chromatography operates on the same way as the extraction. That's why if you're going to look at the topic on extraction, that's the intro for chromatography. It's designed to give the maximum number of equilibria. So yung maximum number ng equilibria natin, yan yung tinatawag natin mga plates. Okay? So instrumental separations method, like chromatography, it's designed to give maximum number of equilibria or theoretical plates. So chromatography operates on the same principle as extraction. But one phase is held in place and the other one moves. So ano yung one phase, uh, one phase uh, held in place? Yun yung stationary phase mo. Tapos yun isa, Okay, nagmumod yun yung mobile phase mo. So yun yung difference ng chromatography doon sa extraction. But the principle is still the same. So the way that you do it, the, the interaction of the solute with the stationary phase to a large extent dictates the so-called distribution coefficient. So the nature of the interaction is one way to categorically generalize your chromatographic method. So what do you think here? Which one is the numerator and which one is the denominator if we put it in terms of K? That's the one here. Okay? So usually, we have the concentration in the mobile, or in the uh, stationary phase over the concentration of the mobile phase. So ganun yung ano, yung similarities ng chromatography doon sa extraction. Okay? So, when we look at the retention on a given column pertains to the particulars of that system, we look at this. The size of the column and the flow rate of the mobile phase. So, the size of the column is directly the one that pertains to the stationary phase, right? And the flow rate of the mobile phase, that's the one that you have in the mobile phase. So we could say these are the two factors that affect the retention of solute. Okay. Now we can look at the average migration time there as just the length of the column over the retention time. So one thing that we can look at the solute retention is yung tinatawag natin capacity factor. Is this the first time for you to encounter this term? What is capacity factor? So we could say your capacity factor, that is your solute partition coefficient ratio. Okay? So that's a more universal measure of retention that's determined from retention time or retention volume. Okay? So capacity factor can be just like retention time minus void time over void time or retention volume minus void volume over void volume. And as I have told you, okay, uh, that is the capacity factor that is your solute partition uh, coefficient ratio. 
So capacity factor is useful for comparing results obtained on different systems since it is independent on the column length and flow rate. Okay. So when you have a capacity factor, this is another way of what we could looking at it. It's useful in understanding the retention mechanisms for a solute since the fundamental definition of K prime here is the moles in this uh, stationary phase over the moles in the mobile phase. Now, this capacity factor is directly related to the strength of the interaction between a solute with stationary phase and mobile phase. So we're going to look at the number here, right? So when we look at the concentration or moles of uh, stationary A's and moles of stationary B, it represents the amount of solute present in each phase at equilibrium. So what do we want here? Okay. So we want the value to be what? We want the capacity factor to be as high as possible, but not too high. Okay. So if we have a, ca a capacity factor that's low, so you have poor separation. If you have a capacity factor that is so high, it's a good separation, but it's not practical. Why is it not practical? If your uh, capacity factor is so high, why is it not practical anymore? Because the separation takes place at a longer period of time. So the one that we want the capacity factor that is auto, uh, optimum is just between two to 10. Kuha ba yun? Yes. So a simple example relating capacity factor to the interactions of a solute in the column is illustrated by partition chromatography. So if you're going to look at this one, so you're, you're looking at the interaction between the mobile phase and the stationary phase, okay? So assuming local equilibrium at the center of the chromatographic peak, so this is what we have. A of stationary phase times volume of stationary phase equals to A, of mobile phase times the volume of the mobile phase. So this alone will give you your what? Distribution coefficient. And then from that, you will get the, the volume that you have there in your stationary phase and the mobile phase. So as the KD increases, the interaction of the solute with the stationary phase becomes more favorable and the solute's retention K increases. And if we go further here, the separation between the two solute requires that the different KDs for their interaction with the mobile phase and the stationary phase since this one. You still remember this? What is this, Jenkem? The I always tell my student the, the delta G equals to rat link. <laughs> Gives free energy. Yep, the free energy. So that's one way for you to get the delta G, right? Because another delta G that you have is this one. I call it the granddaddy. Okay. And then the other one would be that one, the summation of the G products minus delta G reactants, which I call the big mama thing, okay? <laughs> no, it's just telling you here the separations that we have. It's, it, it's not what we call the PKM. I don't want to discuss PKM. traumatic experience of PKM. Uh, 
I only have one 11 and one 12 there because I'm what we call uh, agricultural chemistry major. Okay, so the way that we look at it, kaya pumasok tong PCM, peak separation also represent different changes in free energy. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to look is the so-called efficiency. Okay. So if we're going to look at the efficiency, this is related um, experimentally to a solute thick width. Okay. An efficient system will produce narrow thick. You want your peaks to be narrow, not broad. Because narrow peaks means there's smaller differences in uh, a difference in interactions in order to separate two solutes. So we could say efficiency is related theoretically to the various kinetic uh, processes that are involved in solute retention and transport in the column. So here you just have to determine the width or the standard deviation of the fix. So here where you have this WB or WH Okay, or if you're going to divide by two, WB over two. So if you're going to introduce the standard coefficient here, your WB here is four times the standard deviation. Now your WH that you have here, usually it's 2.354 times the standard deviation. So it's dependent on the amount of time that a solute spends in the column. So again, you will have here your capacity factor uh, uh, or what we call your retention time. Okay. And included in this efficiency, we could say is your number of theoretical plates. So the number of theoretical plates, it just compares the efficiencies of a system for solutes that have different retention time, okay? So the theoretical plate, that's where a solute undergoes equilibrium between the mobile phase and the stationary phase. So the more theoretical plate that you have, okay, so there's more equilibration, then there's much better separation. So it can be equals to N, uh, equals to the retention time over the standard deviation squared or raised to the two, not squared, I squared now, unit. Or for a Gaussian uh, shape peak, it could be N equals to 16 retention time over the base width raised to the two or 5.54 okay, retention time over W. So see the difference between the two? So yung WB, it's this one, in WH, that one. Because you might uh, mistake using both of them. Because uh, I think uh, last time they said, can we use this one? Can we use this one? Well, it depends what you are given. If it's WB or WH. Okay. But the idea here, the larger the end for the column, the better the column will be able to separate two compounds. Okay, The better the ability to resolve solutes that have small differences in retention. And N is, we could say, independent of the solute retention, but dependent on the length of the column. So usually the longer the column, the higher the n, right? If you're going to look at this this way here. So once you have the, the n and the, uh, and the length, you can determine this so-called h or HETP, the height equivalent to theoretical plate or uh, over theoretical plate. 
So as you're going to look at this, H depends on the length and the end. So the longer the length, the higher is the uh, plate height. The smaller the theoretical plate or the number of the theoretical plate, the higher is the H. So H simply gives the length of the column that corresponds to one theoretical plate. Okay. Now, H can also be related to various chromatographic parameters like the flow rate, the particle size, uh, to the kinetic process that gives rise to this so-called thick broadening. Okay. Now, you may ask, why do we have broad peak? Sino usually my broad peak? LC or GC? Only one? Which peak are usually broader, the LC or the GC? Okay. So it's usually the LC. Okay. Now, this band broadening or white uh, band spreading, it, it usually happens because of the different processes. It can be due to our eddy diffusion. Okay, mobile phase mass transfer, stagnant mobile phase mass transfer, stationary phase mass transfer, and longitudinal diffusion. So usually most of them are related to the so-called, excuse me, Bandinter equation. Okay, so this is the reason why you have this big broadening. So it's how your solute interact with the mobile phase and the stationary phase. So if the interaction is just less, we have this one. But if you're going to look at this, there's some sort of broadening. Okay. So if we're going to look at each of them, so when we're talking about this eddy diffusion, so this is just a process that leads to peak or uh, band broadening due to the presence of the multiple flow length through a pack column, okay? So instead of just one path length, so that the numerous flow length that you have here, okay, result in what we call this. Actually, the not have this introduction. <laughs> Okay, so if we're going to look at uh, what's happening during that time, momentum <laughs> ko. So Asolute <laughs> molecules. Asolute molecules travel to the column. Some of them arrive at the end sooner than the others simply due to the different path length that they travel around the what we call support particles in the column that they that result in different travel distances. So this results to this so-called broadening of the column. So parang madami yung daan na, na ano dahil doon sa eddy diffusion. And the different path length that they have there, okay, result in this one broadening. So yan yung eddy diffusion. <laughs> Nawala yung momentum ko. <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> now the next one the mobile phase mass transfer so this is a process of peak broadening caused by the presence of the different flow profile within the channels or between the particles of the support in the column so what happened here a solute in the center of the channel moves more quickly 
Then the Suyut at the ages. So mas mabilis yung nasa gitna kaysa yung nasa periphery. Okay? And it, when it, that happened, it tend to reach the end of the channel first leading to this what we call bond broadening. So hindi sabay-sabay yung movement. Okay? And since hindi sila sabay-sabay, so nagkakaroon ng thick broadening. So the degree of broad bond broadening here uh, due to eddy diffusion and the mobile phase transfer usually depends on the size of the packing material. Okay? And the diffusion rate of the uh, what we call solute. So it just depends on this packing material that you have. Okay? At yung nature no solute mo. How uh, it diffuses in the packing material. Now the other one stagnant. Okay? So when you say stagnant, ano ang ano? Hindi nagalaw, di ba? Okay. So if the stagnant mobile phase tra uh, mass transfers, this is band broadening due to the difference in the rate of diffusion of the solute molecules between the mobile phase outside the pores of the support, that's the flowing mobile phase, to the mobile phase within the pores of the support. Okay. So usually, kapag na ano sa just sa, sa mga pores na stuck siya doon parang nagiging stagnant okay so if you're going to look at this since a col since a solute does not travel down the column when it is just, uh, in the stagnant mobile phase it tends to stay longer it spends longer time in the column than solute that remains in the flowing mobile phase and the degree of this band broadening due to stagnant mobile phase mass transfers depends on the size shape and force structure of the packing material the diffusion and retention of the solute and the flow rate of the solute through the column. So, meron tayo tatlo. Okay? Now, another one that we have is the so-called stationary phase mass transfer. So, if we have the stationary phase mass transfer, This is band broadening due to the movement okay, of solute between the stagnant phase and the stationary phase. So since you have different solute molecules that spend different lengths of time in the stationary phase, they also spend different amount of time on the column giving rise to band broadening. So this is where your solute spent longer time doon sa column nyo, sa stationary phase. And the degree of bond broadening here could be due to the uh, retention and diffusion of the solute, the flow rate of the solute through the column, and the kinetics uh, of interaction between the solute and the stationary phase. Now, last but not the least, we have the so-called longitudinal diffusion. So this is band broadening due to the diffusion of solute along the length of the column in the flowing mobile phase. Now if you're going to look at this longitudinal uh, diffusion, okay, this is the degree of band broadening that depends on the diffusion of the solute and the flow rate of the solute through the column. So if you're going to look at the effect of long, longitudinal diffusion in band broadening. So this is how uh, it happens. Okay, diffusion of solute along the length of the column in the flowing mobile phase. So if it's interaction like this one, so it's a little bit narrow. But if you have it like this, okay, or like this, it becomes to, to what we call broaden. So it's just like you have it like this, and during the uh, diffusion, hindi na sila straight. Okay? Nag ano na sila. Uh, depende sa diffusion ng solute doon sa column. Now, if we're going to look at all of these things that, that we have talked about, okay, th this gives right to this so called Van Dimter equation. I, I don't know. Uh, usually, you only encounter this during the discourse, the Van Dimter equation. Okay? So if you're going to look at the 
Van Dimter equation, there are uh, three things that describes this uh, Van Dimter equation. You have the A, the B, and the C. Okay? So if you're going to look at the Van Dimter equation or the, the curve that you observe here, this is just a combined results of the three individual phenomena. So yeah, A, B, and C, each of them represent a certain phenomena. Okay? So what do you think is A? What do you think is A from the one that we discussed? So A is what we call one that represents the eddy diffusion or the mo and the mobile phase mass transfer. A is what we call the multipath term. Okay. So the A term that you have here, based on this, is this one. Now, B, on the other hand, that represents what? The longitudinal diffusion. Okay? So if you're going to look at this uh, longitudinal uh, diffusion, that's this. No, that, that, that's the whole thing. So A is just the one that you have here. B is the one that you have here. So B is minus mu, the linear velocity, the flow rate times the void volume divided by length. And C is what we call the mobile and stationary phase mass transfer term. Okay, and that's the one that you have here. And if you combine it, this is what you have. Parang ano ng Nike logo. Okay. And from that, you can also get the so-called height equivalent to theoretical plate. So the relationship, one use of the plate height is to relate this kinetic process to band broadening to a parameter of the chromatographic system like the flow rate. And this relationship is used to predict what the resulting effect would be of varying parameter to the overall efficiency of the chromatographic system. I think in my recorded site, I, I discuss more of this Van Dimter plot. Okay, so we could say from the Van Dimter plot, it's just one way also to get your H. Okay, so from the same Van Dimter plot, it, uh, it shows you how H would change with the so-called linear velocity. And your linear velocity nyo lang is your what we call flow rate. Okay? So usually they said if you increase the flow rate, the retention time will become what? Shorter, longer. Taking up. If you increase the flow rate, what happened to the retention time? Will it be longer or shorter? Shorter? <laughs> so when you increase the flow rate, it will be short, shorter. Okay. And sometimes it has a better resolution or we could say the narrow peak. And if you're going to look at this optimal linear velocity, that's where H has the minimum value and the point of maximum column efficiency. So that is the one that you have here. Okay. So it's easy to achieve for gas chrome, but it's too small for liquid chrome because liquid chrome requires what flow rates higher than optimal to separate compounds. So if you're going to compare the Van Dimter plot for GC and LC, what can you say? What's the difference of the Van Dimter plot of uh, GC and LC? They, they are the same like that, but there's always what we call difference between the two. So what happened at low? Flow rate. 
what happened to plate height? So at low flow rate, okay, your plate height would decrease, okay, with increasing flow rate. And this is due to what? Your longitudinal diffusion term. And it has a larger effect on GC. Okay, usually, where is the plate height smaller? Saan mas mababa yung plate height? GC or LC? So we, we can always go back to length. Okay. So ito yung mate ano eh. Uh, ang main difference ng LC at GC dito eh. So ang question dyan, kung mahaba ito, mataas to. Kung mababa ito, mababa din ito. So ang tanong, alin yung mas mahaba yung column? So it's usually the GC. So since the GC has longer column, its plate height will be higher. Okay, so LC would have what? Smaller plate height compared to the GC. Okay. So what other else we, uh, we need to know? We have this so-called the master for solute separation. So this is what we call the separation factor. Okay. So when we talk about the separation factor, there is what we call a formula for it. And the formula is shown here as just what? Capacity factor of the second uh, component over the capacity factor of the first component. So this is the uh, uh, separation factor is a parameter used to describes how well two solutes are separated by a chromatographic system. So as much as possible, okay, you want them to be separated from one another. Now, this doesn't consider the effect of column efficiency or peak width. It only shows the retention. So a value of a separation factor or alpha Okay, uh, more than 1.1 is usually indicative of a good separation. We, we might have uh, some calculation uh, by the end. And then to look at the separation between the two, how well they are separated, you, you look at the so-called resolution. And resolution is just equals to the difference of the retention time over, okay, the average of the width of the two samples. So this one is not good. Its resolution is less than 1.75. This one you can be separation, but still not good. So this one is the best one. Now, resolution is preferred over the separation factor. Since both retention and column efficiency are considered in defining the resolution. So a resolution value of 1.5 represent baseline resolution or complete separation of two neighboring solute. And that's the ideal case. Now, a resolution of one is considered adequate for most separation. Okay? So question before we go on problems. Question before we go with the problems. So let's try to solve the first one. Excuse me. 
So you're asked to calculate the adjusted retention time and capacity factor for benzene and toluene in a GC experiment. So methane as a solvent peak is at 42 degree, uh, 42 seconds, benzene at 251, and toluene is at 333 seconds. So paano sagot natin dito? So we, we can look at the difference first, right? So we can look 251 minus 42, 333 minus 42, right? And then what do we do from that? Get the K for each of them. So, paano yung K? 251 minus 42 over 42. And the other one is 333 minus 42 over 42. Tama? So, the first one that I did, that's the adjusted retention time. And the second one is your so-called capacity factor. So, ano yung sagot dito? 251.42, that's 209. And this one? Anyone? 291. So, that's your adjusted retention time. You, 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 you subtract your retention time with the void time. And then from that, we can get the capacity factor. So for each of them. So for the 251, that's your benzene. So what's the capacity factor that you get? Anyone? So ito yung mga question na pwede ito ng sa board exam. Tapos na ba board exam today? Or kahapon pa? May sa mga may mga brad and sisters. Ah, kahapon pa. Okay. So tapos na yung paghihirap ng mga kakilala nyo. So ang next na gagawin nila ay magdasal. Right? So one is Ano yung sagot? Wala kasi akong calcu eh. That's why I just depend on you. 4.98. Around 5. Tapos itong isa. 6.93. Or let's say around 6.9. Okay. So question dyan. Pag lumabas sa board exam na ganito, kaya. The next question. In an open tubular column, the methane as a solvent peak is at 42 seconds and benzene peak at 251. So calculate the partition coefficient for benzene between stationary and mobile phase and the fraction of time spent in the mobile phase. So maybe the one that we can have here is the first question. So we are asked here to calculate for K. I'm trying to see. Meron bang kulang? So it's still five, the capacity factor. But how are we going to calculate for the big K?
Because usually ang ano ko dito when I solve this. So you have that one, right? So you will have here what? 5.0? But I think I missed some values here. Because if we do K, where do we get K? So K prime is just equals to TR minus TM over TM, right? Then this could also be equals to T of S over T of M. So if we're going to what we call simplify this, so K prime is equals to T of S over T of M. So T of S is equals to what? Tama? Because what we're going to do, okay, we end up with five as the capacity factor. So I want to look at the fraction of time in the mobile phase. So what will I do here if I'm going to replace this? Dito. So K prime equals to TS minus TM, TR minus TM over TM, and that is equals to TS over TM. I'm trying to look at my notes. So if I have TM, over TS plus TM, what will I do? I want everything to be TM. So your TS will become this. So ano mangyayari? Can I make this like one? K prime plus one, and this become, what's the value of my K? What is one over six? So that's the fraction of time. But I think that's not a common, this is not a common problem. Anyway, okay, we can ignore that one. And then go on in this last problem and call it a day. So a solute with a retention time of 407 seconds has a base width of 13 seconds on the 12.2 meters column. So find the plate height and the number of plates. So ito yung mga question na pang board exam. Uh. So imagine, nagbo-board kayo ngayon. So how are we going to solve this?
So we can get for what? N first? Ano yung gamitin natin N? Yung 16? Tama. Then we replace it with 407 divided by 13. Di ba yan? So ano makukuha nyo? Wala akong calcium. Let me get plus. Fifteen thousand something. So we can round it up to what? One point fifty seven times ten to the one, two, three, four. Right? So how do we solve the next one? H equals to Ln. So what we ask is one what the theoretical plate. So you have 12.2 meters. So you have 1.57 times 10 to the 4. So you have there. Ilan or gano kahaba yung each theoretical plate. Basa. <laughs> So you will have 7.7 .7 times 10 to the negative 4 meter. So kapag minultiply natin ng 1,000, that is what? 0.78 millimeter. Tama. Ang pangit kasi pakinggan. 7.77 times 10 to the negative 4 meter. So we might as well simplify it. Tanong. That's the end. Tanong class. So we have one more meeting this week. And then after that, you will have, ilan, ilan yung ano natin break? Tatlong, tatlong meetings na hindi tayo mag -meet. Am I right? Kasi sa 24 break nyo, eh hanggang ano yun, di ba? Or babalik na tayo dun sa November 2. Na dalawa lang. <laughs> Malas nyo. Wednesday, Thursday pala tayo. Wednesday, Friday pala tayo. Akala ko yung Tuesday, Thursday class ko. Sila yung tatlo. Sorry. <laughs> Not my fault. Isa lang kasi hanggang... What? Ah, okay. So you only have the break yung week ng November... Ano, ah, ng, ng October 24. Okay? So we still meet next meeting, but I want you to look at this, what we called the uh, recorded lecture. I just supplement it with what we have at this time. Okay? So tanong. Before we call it a day. Ano yung PowerPoint ko? <laughs> wala 
<laughs> but I'm going to make the thing uh, available. Kasi ang ginagamit ko ay yung materials ng UPLB. So hindi na ako nagbago. So nagdadagdag na lang ako ngayon. Discord. Yeah, I'll post it. One of these days. Oh, may tanong pa? 